Hello, um, Happy New Year and welcome to this, our first Inside Out Talk for 2022. The mission of our prestigious Inside Out Lecture Series is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across Leeds School of Arts at Leeds Beckett University. This includes students studying fine art, graphic design, architecture, landscape architecture, performance, illustration and fashion. My name is Marion Harrison, Senior Lecturer in Fine Art, and with my colleague, Dr. Anya Connor Crabb, Senior Lecturer in Fashion, we are really delighted to be hosting today's talk, Fashion and Nature, with Professor Kate Fletcher. Kate is a pioneer in the field of fashion and sustainability. She's a design activist, writer, nature enthusiast, and research professor. Anya will be chairing uh, Q&As with Kate after her talk. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask Kate, please go to www.slido.com and put your question using the hashtag in uh, capitals LSA-KF. So I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Anna Connor Crabb um, to introduce Kate and to start this Inside Out talk. Thank you, Marion. Uh, we're very excited that Kate is able to join us here today. And thank you, Kate, for taking the time to talk to us here about your work. Kate Fletcher is a research professor at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion at the University of the Arts London. Kate is also the co-founder of the Union of Concerned Researchers in Fashion. She's the most cited scholar with over 70 publications in the field, and her work on post-growth fashion and fashion localism has shaped and challenged the field of fashion, textiles and sustainability worldwide. Her most recent concept of Earth Logic recommends an actionable path for radical change in fashion. And I'll hand over to you, Kate. Oh, thank you, Anya. Thank you, Marion. Hello, everybody. A pleasure to be here. I'm very excited uh, to be joining you today. Um, my talk today is um, perhaps not the usual story of fashion and nature, um, because my interest really lies elsewhere. The reason for this is that the usual story of clothing, textiles, environment, fashion and nature is a story that's largely shaped by modernist industrial priorities and an instrumental reductionist approach to change. And I don't think that's the way that we need to proceed. So instead, and inspired by the science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin, I want to look for action and heroics in new places. And that's what I'm going to explore with you today. But before I go out and forward into this world, I first want to go back because this is also central to the story. I was born and grew up in Liverpool, um, a city that I'm sure you'll know is in the north of England, but for those of you perhaps not from the UK watching this, um, now you do, it's in the northwest and I was born in a working class family. In the 70s and 80s when I grew up there, it was a very bleak place with few jobs and even fewer opportunities. Margaret Thatcher uh, was in power at the time and she famously condemned the city of Liverpool to a state of what they called managed decline. And this was partly in response to the city's militancy and to the various strikes around dock workers and, and other things at the time. The effect of this was that the UK government chose not to invest in the city or its people. And the result was a hemorrhaging of, of finance, uh, ideas, possibilities, and it grew into a very dismal place, quite frankly. Um, There's many things that I learned then. I learned about inequality, I learned about violence on the streets, um, I learned about the solidarity and action of neighbours, uh, I learned about making, thrift, hardship. Um, and when uh, I was growing up, uh, my parents were not well connected. We didn't have any cultural capital. And I remember being told uh, by my grandparents 
when I talked about my plans to go to university, that they told me that that wasn't for working class girls, um, that instead I should go and work in a shop, um, that shop work was good work um, for women. They told me uh, to recognise my position in the class hierarchy and to stick within it. They told me, like I'm sure many people on this call, call have already heard, you know, know your place. Um, but in many ways, uh, that's what I've been trying to do ever since, literally learning about my place, caring for it, cherishing it. And by that, I mean this place. Um, this is our place. And of course, this planet, our place, is a planet on the edge, a planet that shapes every activity, including every design activity. It is our beginning and our end. Um, in 2009, a comprehensive piece of research was done at the Stockholm Resilience Centre that identified nine planetary boundaries that if transgressed would then lead to unpredictable instability in Earth systems. So at least three planetary boundaries of those nine that were identified have already been crossed. The rate of human intervention in nitrogen cycles, climate change, which I'm sure is not news to anybody, and rate of biodiversity loss. Underpinning all this, I think, more generally in society, perhaps more widely in culture, there seems to be some sort of a disconnection with a lack of linking of ecological systems of nature to daily life. Perhaps it is that we don't really feel that we see ecological decline firsthand. Maybe there's some sense of separation or disconnect from these systems that give us life. And this is definitely part of the problem. And yet increasingly it's difficult to ignore in, in February 2019 in the same week, this is exactly the same week in Chicago, there was the polar vortex which led to temperatures of minus 40 below freezing. And in that same week, a heat wave in ours where the conditions on various beaches, you know, was plus 40. Um, then more recently, very recently, just last year, there were major floods in Netherlands and in Germany. There was the, um, the wildfires in Siberia that were unprecedented and released huge amounts of CO2. And then, of course, just after the new year, there were fires, uh, more wildfires this time in Colorado, and it's not fire season um, in Colorado at the moment. Um, I think the point here is a point that perhaps you all understand, but I want, before I go any further, just to digress a little and just to do a little quiz. So this, just grab a piece of paper or something, or maybe just memorise the answers to this as you're going. Um, I wonder, please, if you could make a note of whether you know what the name of these species are. It's the first one. Quickly moving on to the second, the third, and the fourth. And then the next round of this is just a question whether, whether you can name the brands. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to ask you how you did. Of course I'm not. I'm not in any way going to do that. But sometimes I think it's useful to have a litmus test of the state of play. What we know uh, from society is that children are routinely better at naming brands than naming wildlife. And I think my, my question to you is, what do you think that signifies? So fashion, of course, is a key contributor to the creeping global ecological and social mega crisis. Um, there are numerous ill effects, uh, many of them layered over the top of each other in ways that prove very uh, entangled and difficult um, to act upon. These include the damaging effects of agricultural practices, polluting and resource intensive manufacturing, 
exploitation of garment workers, the damaging effect of fashion imagery and trends, excess and wastefulness linked to consumerism. And perhaps no part of contemporary life reflects consumer culture as much as the fashion sector. And by the same token, no part of contemporary life is a better route in to the tangle of social structures, economic priorities, cultural norms, ways of knowing, ideas about what's valuable, um, all of these things. No better way in, perhaps, than fashion. Underpinning all of this within the West, largely as a philosophy that's rooted in Western modernism. And here, these are the social and economic structures. This is how they're shaped in the global north. And these have tended to lead to a situation where nature is remote, distanced and unknown. And this is, of course, part of the legacy of Descartes, who famously framed the head or thought as separate from and superior to the body and the world. Um, and the, what this enabled, if you like, is a set of disassociating tendencies which distance humans from nature, the head, rational, the mind from the natural world in which we live. And disassociation is about separation from context. And it's where an action, a thing, a garment, say, is understood independent from its surroundings. And when you see things that way, you tend to overlook relationships. So instead, what you do, or what we all do, uh, is to establish a world full of disconnections. And this distances us from the consequences of an action, a choice. And it's important because this very distance is the thing that governs whether people are willing to inflict harm. The closer you are to something, the less harm you're willing to inflict, generally speaking. When a victim, maybe it's an ecosystem or an individual, uh, is more immediate and salient to you, then you tend to change your behaviour. So the, uh, the legacy of Descartes is, of course, the Cartesian split, and this tends to place humans in a sphere apart, outside and above ecology. Most uh, of this um, uh, is, is linked to a sense of human centeredness. And in fact, many environmental philosophers have said that Western culture is ecologically destructed primarily because it's human centered. And here we tend to trick ourselves with fancies like it's industry that's supporting us with goods and services, while for forgetting, of course, what it is that supports industry. And we also trick ourselves with assumptions like those in neoclassical economics that consider the environment to be a subset of the human economy. Also in this, uh, this Cartesian split, nature is viewed as a resource and means to an end. Uh, nature is not seen as creative uh, or full of agency, but instead it's seen as a source of interchangeable and replaceable units, that is resources for use by humans. Further, it tends to promote an insensitivity to nature's diversity. We only tend to notice nature in ways that contribute to human interests. And we tend to, to conceive these interests as separate to nature's interests. It's almost as if humans see that biodiversity has no inherent value in itself, and that it's valuable only in terms of what it enables humans to do. Not only that, is that we find it very difficult to find the wild in us. We think that wildness is the only associated with things that aren't human. Yet, and I'm sure you knew I was going to say this, 
we are part of nature and nature isn't dumb matter easily omitted our first requirement is to preserve the land the ecological health of the earth if it doesn't thrive we cannot thrive and the natural systems which are often obscured by contemporary culture, by fashion culture. These are the systems that are actually in charge of everything. So maybe it's time that we started acting on that knowledge. So our challenge therefore is to connect and associate, to care for the earth, which demands that we think and act differently, that we act in ways to grow our ecological identities. This is what fashion and nature is. Nature, the enabler of the fashion system, and nature also as fashion's limiting factor. This sense of what are the planetary limits, the boundaries around which we cannot keep on growing. This sense of natural limits and also natural possibilities for fashion are at the core of a changed understanding. What we know at the moment is that the fashion system is optimised for growth. And yet all the things that we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years, all the various eco innovations that people, including me and including many of those of you on this call, have probably been doing things like uh, substituting um, out harmful fibres and, and, and putting in preferred lower impact fibres, finding ways to reduce the impact of a supply chain process, maybe introducing transparent supply chains, maybe recycling, upcycling, all of these things that people have been doing. These are described as eco-efficiency initiatives. But the problem is, is that these eco-efficiency gains don't mean much when the sector as a whole is growing all of the time. Uh, just a few days ago, I heard that uh, the fashion sector is projected to have a 6% global growth this year, this year in which there's a climate emergency. And while it's the case that many individuals, you and I, we personally may use fewer resources and we may create less pollution. It's the gross impact of the collective system that is the indicator that matters here, because it's the collective effect that causes total ecological harm. And this indicator is showing that things are getting worse, not better. That the net impact of the fashion sector is still increasing despite all of our efforts. And perhaps as we build understanding around these issues, it seems that we're, we see that there needs to be real radical change in the way we approach these challenges. The current approaches, I think, have been all too similar to each other. They're probably being too sort of simple, maybe too neat, not messy enough, not recognising reality. Um, they certainly haven't taken account of other species. They're not recognising the interconnected forces that influence the whole system. Also, what we know, uh, and this is really frustrating, but still it's good to know, that a green product inserted into a conventional fashion system does very little to change behaviour. Instead, we have to become uncompromisingly systemic. We have to look to the big system and ask questions about that. This requires us to do something which, I mean, sounds quite easy. I mean, I can say it in about two seconds, but uh, the challenge is something else. We have to continuously hold the whole picture. And this necessitates an entire shift in thinking and approach. We need to shift our gaze from products to practices, from materials to systems. We need to work closer to the source, uh, to the foundational principles of the system. This is important because the things that we've been trying already 
just don't affect the political and economic forces that are fundamentally shaping what we're doing in any particular way. What I'm advocating for is that we begin to act systemically at the level of the paradigm. And uh, I'm now going to talk a little about the work of Earth Logic, which is a project that I've um, been working on together with my wonderful colleague and longtime collaborator, Matilda Tam from Linnaeus University in the south of Sweden. Earth Logic is free uh, to download. It's in uh, three or I think four languages um, now. Uh, so please visit the website and download the report. The idea behind Earth Logic is that it's a science-based plan for urgent action in fashion. It's a radical invitation to business leaders, to designers, to governance, the media, to citizens, to stylists, to charity shop uh, workers, to all stakeholders to put Earth first and transform the fashion sector. Critically, there's two parts of this that I just wanted to, to flag to you. We call it an action research plan because for us, we feel that time is too short for us to first do all the research and get some clear guidance about what this is and then pass it over to somebody else to take it to action. We just don't have time for things to be fully peer reviewed and to then put, be put on a library shelf or to be published in a journal. We just simply don't have time for that. The climate emergency is too pressing. Instead, we have to act with rigour in a robust way, but we need to bring the phases of action and research together. And it's also a plan. A plan because we need to be strategic about what we're doing and we can't start from scratch. In fact, what's the point of doing that? We have to build on the work of others. And this also includes us starting from advanced places um, which we lay out in Earth Logic. So in Earth Logic, we often talk in terms of fashion nests, and this just helps explain why it's really important for us to work at the level of the purpose or the paradigm of the, se the sector. It's almost like there's three generation of approaches, and to date, most emphasis has been placed on the first generation of approaches, the product. This is where, for example, organic cotton is exchanged and is put into the system to replace conventionally grown cotton. I mean, this is worthwhile doing, but in itself, it's not going to transform the sector. Then people work at the level of the system, the second generation of approaches. So this includes new business models, maybe product service systems, things like this. These sorts of activities are also of value. However, improvements that they deliver are soon eaten up as the sector expands. So instead, at the third generation of approaches, which is working with the culture and mindset, the purpose or paradigm of the sector, this is where meaningful and long lasting change will take place. This is where we need to base our work. And without change here, the sector will just keep growing and at best it will just get worse more slowly. Earth Logic uh, sets out six different landscapes for fashion action research. We see them as holistic. Uh, we also see each landscape as offering pathways for different actors and disciplines to collaborate. Each one also contains an imperative to reformulate industry away from the physical accumulation of goods and towards care and maintenance. In each landscape, there is a role for each of us to play already today. These aren't fictions for the future. They're practices that have started and can be started anywhere specifically. The landscapes are less grow out of growth, local, which is about scaling and recentering, plural, new centres for fashion, learning, new knowledge, mindsets, language about communication and governance. These are ways of regulating, organising fashion. 
The first we call goal landscapes, and these very much correspond or can be seen to correspond with the sustainable development goals. And the second three are action landscapes, and these help us enact or meet these goals. So EarthLogic also has other aspects to it. It offers a support framework. Uh, it puts forward some core values to help keep work on a radical track. It, we mobilise the idea of staying with the trouble from Donna Haraway. And this helps us uh, stay central to the true purpose, even when things get difficult. And we also lean very heavily on ideas of care and we mobilise care as an essential way forward in, as we move towards uh, an earth logic journey. Not only that, but we, we invest heavily in grounded imagination. This isn't the sort of fantasy world which is unconnected from rooted places and other things, but it's actually imagination that's rooted in our lives and the places in which we live and the ecosystems that are there. So EarthLogic also includes a checklist uh, for what to take with you for the journey ahead and also the things that you need to leave behind. Some of the things we just can't take with us. We can't, for instance, take with us uh, ideas that technology is going to fix everything. It just simply won't. We also have to leave behind the notion that it's somebody else's responsibility to work in this space or that there's a one size fits all solution. These are the things that we're going to have to leave behind. And as we go forward, what will we pack in our bag? Like you take a bag on a journey, what will we pack? Well, maybe we will pack courage, community, resilience, imagination. EarthLogic uh, was first released uh, in 2019 and then there was a big launch at London Fashion Week and since then Matilda and I have been working on lots of other projects. Um, to be released in the next couple of months is our latest work called EarthLogic Gardening where, where we use uh, the metaphor of gardening and think about cultivating uh, practices as a way to help move ideas to action and then also we've been working on ideas around local fashion governance and we held a workshop just before Christmas uh, in Lancaster uh, to explore what that might be in the northwest um, of England. So watch this space. So some of the other things that I feel are really pertinent to this conversation around fashion and nature include a recognition of, of place in all of this. And now I'm going to talk with reference to a research project that I did, which was called Fashion Ecologies. And the starting point for this was that place matters and actually that local ecosystems provide both the resources and the constraints to an area's activity, including its fashion activity. And that people and communities evolve within the unique natural and social assets of where they're based. What I think is critical to hold on to here is that place gives unique form to a fashion system and it holds promise to foster a change in fashion culture and maybe even to switch to less consumption. Yet, of course, all the signs seem to point in the opposite direction. The fashion industry is particularly fluid and mobile. And in the last 30 years, it's fundamentally changed the scales and arguably the intelligibility uh, of its operations. So as we all know, apparel companies shift manufacturing to the places uh, with low lowest wage costs. Uh, and a changing landscape of international trade quotas eases the caps and restrictions and has essentially greased the wheels of um, the globalization process. But this isn't the only way to be. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen or are familiar with the work of David Fleming. I'm just going to hold this up here. I'm sure you can probably see me do that. But he um, 
he produced this wonderful uh, compendium, as he calls it, a dictionary of the future and how to survive it. And I'm just going to read from the entry on localization. I do know that, the, that uh, this dictionary is now available online, so it's free uh, to download. Um, and I'm just going to read a little. In fact, I'm going to, have to put my glasses on in order to read from this um, entry. He says, actually, actually put my glasses on rather than. <laughs> um, the political economies of the future will be essentially local. They will use locally generated energy and local land and materials producing for local consumption and reusing their wastes. They will be managed, given life, competence and resilience by the people who live there, partic participants in daily touch with the local detail. Their infrastructures will be minimal. They will have access to equipment and resources which are as advanced as possible given the limits imposed by the local scale. And he goes on. But what he does there is he fleshes out a real sense of local as an alternative. And in fact, what localism tends to do is it tends to concentrate political and economic power inside communities. This is one of the things about why it's so important is because it gives people a sense of control over their lives and also the quality of the places in which they live. And if you compare that, for instance, with contemporary capitalism, it is a centrifugal force. It generates directions of travel away from the distinctions of a specific ecosystem, community or a place. One of the things that I feel it's really important to stress is that localism is not only a phenomenon, a phenomenon of regional manufacturing and decentralised distribution systems alone. It's not captured totally by the artisan, by quality traditional fibre cloth, by heritage pieces, by tweed, by country wear. Localism doesn't come from these places alone. It comes from synthesis. It's a mixture of things. Um, and this, I think, is where it's really useful to draw upon this idea that fashion systems are actually ecologies. So, so what is ecology? Ecology uh, is the, the study um, of uh, relationships between beings, or I'm going to substitute the word clothing or garments or, or fashion there, between beings and their surroundings, their place. And what importantly this does is it begins to build a sensitivity towards recognising relationships are cri critical to this process. As part of uh, this fashion ecology's work, there's a big piece of field work that was done um, in Macclesfield, which is the closest town to where I live. I just live in, in the, the Peak District, just south of um, Manchester. And um, what I think from this field work, what began to be really uh, clear is that localism frames fashion as an integrated whole its garments, its clothing practices, its production, its people, its place, including, quite frankly, the unpopular bits. You can't reduce localism to single components, maybe the, the ones that you wish that you could. It's all of this stuff and more. Often, quite frankly, it's not pretty. And this is really important because we begin to recognise that actually fashion's culture is a reflection of the places in which we live. And by the same token, fashion can help remake the places in which we live, if we're clear about it. One of the things that became really evident in this work that took place for the Fashion Ecologies project in Macclesfield is that there's a huge amount of activity that goes on in most places that's sort of out of sight 
that it's hidden. It's almost like in a subterranean world. It's a system that supports clothing production, consumption, use. It's in households, it's in community groups. It happens between families. It happens in the informal economy. And all of this stuff that's going on makes the visible activity, the stuff that contributes to the economic indicators that the government holds up, it makes the this above ground stuff run. Without it, it tends to fall apart. Critically, no one advocates for the unseen actions and activities. And for me, anyway, one of the things that felt really important about looking at localism in this way is to begin to recognise that we need to cultivate both parts of this and not only the bit that everybody thinks about when you think about our oh, local fashion, now it's like regional, let's regionally organise manufacturing. Ultimately, what I'm saying is there's a big underground network and we need to cultivate the soil as much as pick the crops. So in uh, Macclesfield, uh, amongst many other different things, there are a few little projects and interventions and in the local laundrette, uh, it's still there today actually, um, uh, is a small uh, little repair box which we called a haberdash emergency and this was just there for people to be able to access and use, to fix their clothes, to sit there and work as uh, as they were waiting for their laundry to happen. We made other things too. We made a map, uh, an alternative map of Macclesfield that didn't take you to the shops, very few shops now granted, on the high street, but actually took you to the places that enabled fashion actions to occur. Other things too included a pocket guide to fashion ecology um, with some alternative definitions for fashion in there, which is free to download from the Fashion Ecologies website. Um, perhaps one of the most enduring things uh, that emerged uh, from that piece of field work was a, was a feeling of, of how little um, I know, <laughs> of how much complexity there is, and much of it is beyond you. You have these sort of glimpses of part of it. Also, how much diversity there is, and it's a it's a process of great humility you, know, you end up realising, OK, I'm so limited, I'm so finite in all of this. Also, what felt really important is, is that this humbling is not really recognised uh, within the narrow views of design that are tied to industrial purpose. So I think this, this sort of humbling uh, also is essential if we're going to extend our focus, our care to include all species. Val Plumwood, uh, the environmental philosopher, uh, she, um, I'm sort of riffing off what she was saying here, but she said, you know, we have to find a way to extend beyond the usual stopping points. So there are places that maybe we say, oh yeah, yeah, we're really, you know, sympathetic for giraffes and, and elephants but actually we're not that fussed about ants maybe or something but she wanted us to find a way to to go beyond those usual stopping points and include all species and care for all the earth and so if we're going to take our lead from Val Plumwood and the various scholars like Maria Puig de la Bella Casa who have written extensively around care if we're going to take our lead from them, we need to put forward a larger frame of care that moves beyond human centeredness and considers new relationships between design and nature where humans are but one of many focus points. It's not saying that humans uh, are not important, absolutely are, uh, perhaps it's just that they're not the only uh, focus for our attention. So then the question becomes, can we design in ways to enhance our understanding of our embeddedness in the world in which we live? And how can we design in a way that prioritizes relationships? How 
Can we design while acknowledging uncertainty and the limits of human knowledge? How can we design to reveal resonance with the world? When we're thinking about um, uh, new methods and practices of design in line with nature, different things come to the fore. Working with others in co constantly collaborative ways, so collaborative practices become very important, as does participatory design, action research, for instance, and uh, the role of direct experience. Using our own finite experience drawn from our lives as the basis of which from which to develop understanding. We do this as a way to break apart a sort of single one world view and framework that tends to fa be favoured within Euro-American modernist perspectives. The idea is, is that we know better when we know through diverse, cumulative and the very particular stories of our lives. Frequently it's talked about, oh yeah, we need, we need knowledge, we need knowledge, but I think what we really need is understanding, not so much positive knowledge, because understanding comes from a keen sense of observation and continuous learning about the system in which we live. One uh, of the things that I have spent quite a lot of time doing uh, over the last five years is uh, to try to develop uh, the skills of noticing, uh, paying attention as a way uh, to learn about the system in which I live. And one of the ways that I've been doing that is to use sort of autobiography to write about nature and fashion uh, by, and draw upon my life and to write about it in such a way that these are sort of texts or small stories. Um, so here um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that's um, in the book Wild Dress uh, and also there's a new book uh, coming out uh, in, um, in May uh, called Outfitting and that's together with um, an amazing poet called Helen Mort who's based in Sheffield. Um, here I think what I've found is that for me anyway writing about fashion and nature uh, drawing upon my life has become uh, a way uh, to take action and I think what life writing is concerned about it's concerned about the places uh, that we inhabit it helps us be sort of present there and maybe um, one of the things that I think people sometimes struggle with is they sort of think oh yeah it must all be about about well it is effectively all about me it's drawing from my life but I'm not doing this because my life is interesting it's not like an ego trip but actually what happens is that in the very particular stories from other people's lives you see a resonance and a connection with your own life and your own stories and it's a way I think uh, that we can begin to understand things in different terms so one of the things that writing from nature and clothing perspectives together in this new hybrid form has enabled me to do it's to get closer to place and what I try to do is I try to talk about my own embeddedness if you like within the earth as a starting point for a new type of understanding and engagement with what fashion is and can be Critically, um, there's a lot uh, about the senses in this work, there's a lot about the body, there's a lot about emotions as much as sort of logic in the mind. There's, I write about how my body moves in and experiences different settings. I write about the physicality of garments, also as well as their restrictions and the associations of place. Um, I also about, write about what clothing reveals and enables in the world. 
I think that there's so many different things that can be said about this practice. It's not obviously going to be for everybody. And yet there's something with the deliberate paying attention to what clothes are and can be, uh, especially when we think about relational actions. I think one of the things that everybody would admit and acknowledge about narratives and you know telling stories is that they enable us to keep alive multiple lines of inquiry, really complex storytelling at the same time. It can be held within a really well told story and it can find a way to represent different centres of knowledge. It can describe what's between things, not just the things themselves and how they relate. And I think that using writing and sometimes it's not writing, it's sketching, it's photographs, it's all the mixed together. People do this by uh, journaling or writing in poetry or writing in song or lots of other things. But this type of practice helps in a way um, bring us into a relationship with our neighbours through the process of record making, reflection, revisiting, mark making. <clears throat> including with others. Um, this relational focus in uh, this work is a ready ally uh, with feminist perspectives and the lived realities of power inequalities and marginalization of women and women's experience. I'm not sure if any of you have ever read any nature writing, but by and large it's written by men and it's frequently about uh, it's about expedition and conquest and climbing highest and other things. But actually, what if this work is about real life? If it's about the grind of, you know, getting your kids up and to school uh, and back to, you know, making tea, getting them back to bed. What if it's about daily experience? Then these relationships become rich and uh, hopefully they offer us the, the prospect of seeing greater plurality um, brought, I think, because they show us about the world in lots of different ways. Maybe what these narratives try to do is to take the human out of the place of soul focus and to try to amplify other voices and experiences. And maybe they don't do that very well, but it's a work in progress. Oh, right, I'm going to read you now uh, a little excerpt from uh, Wild Dress and then I'm going to conclude. So this is an excerpt from a story uh, that's called uh, Walking in Skirts. I remember as a teenager that my paternal grandfather once said, women with skirts up can run faster than men with trousers down. And he said this as a sexist joke. He often liked to rehearse his views that women and men were unequal. For instance, when I talked about following my older brother to university, he told me to know my place. Working the cash register in a shop, he said, was good work for girls as he ordered me into the kitchen to wash the dishes. The skirts up one liner was, I think, the only time that he ever alluded to sex in my earshot. Perhaps that's why it stayed with me. That and because aside from the chauvinism, the quip belies a literal truth. Legs pivot at the hips and hinge at the knees and thus the speed of gait and fluidity of movement in a skirt is real. It's massively eased by a wrap of fabric that skims the pelvis and falls loosely around the legs. Walking and sometimes running in the hills in a skirt is a revelation. It's an exercise in rare freedom. I urge you to try it. Trousers can bunch and pull on the thighs, reining in the limbs and muscles, but a skirt is all space. A skirt is a modest but as commodious version of a birthday suit. It seems to me that a skirt also holds promise of a different sort of natural understanding. The same stretch of land 
seems altered when you navigate it in a skirt. You notice different things about it. A skirt is a kaleidoscope. It brings new things into view. And isn't that what we all need to see the world more fully? It goes without saying that not all skirts enable unencumbered stepping. Scottish clans knew this and the pleated kilt is perhaps the obvious model of an outdoor walking, working, running skirt. But I don't own a kilt. But I do have other skirts and dresses and they've granted me an education in both natural features and ergonomics. The first thing I learned is linked to skirt length. For me, wearing a skirt in the hills that falls way below the knee is like wearing a blindfold. It's exciting, but dangerous. I've fallen over and slipped and tripped many times because my boots blithely strike out over invisible ground, cloaked by the folds of my skirt. The cloaking effect happens especially when walking uphill or climbing over a wall when the distance from the waist to the ground shortens and the skirt's fabric pulls forward, gravity acting to cascade it downwards and directly into the line of sky sight of the feet. To avoid this, you just need a spare hand to hold the skirt up or just a shorter skirt. So it is that topography draws skirt length. In flatlands, long skirts are A-OK. -okay. For hills, take out the scissors and hem your dress higher. Now I'm going to just jump towards the end. At midsummer a few years ago, I walked for a week in the northernmost part of Sweden on a route across an exquisite area of tundra inside the Arctic Circle. Before I left, I asked Ingun, um, a Norwegian friend of mine, well used to living high in the north, what I should wear. Smart as a whip, she replied, a skirt, a silk skirt. So I wasted no time and rifled through my chest of drawers for something suitable. Her thinking was that such an item was light in a rucksack, it packs down small and silk dries fast. In my wardrobe, I found a bias cut silk dress from the 1950s that had been my grandma's. It was a delicate beige with an orange and mid-brown irregular stripe. The fabric was thin and torn in places and I decided to cut across the bodice to make a skirt, adding a wide elasticated waistband and some darts. And then I shortened it a little to sit just below the knee. On the first day of the trip, I put the skirt on over thick woolen leggings. It was an unusual get up, to say the least, actually. I looked like a, like a babushka or an onion or something. Layers of hand-me-down woolen jumpers, a scarf, leggings and old silk. When she saw me, Karen, the friend who I was walking with, just was laughing at me and disbelieving. What was my motivation? She wanted to know. Was I trying to like get attention, to flirt, to pull? I insisted that the skirt was practical. It's practical to Karen, it's not sexual. And she raised an eyebrow. She just didn't know about walking in skirts. I think she took the skirt as a sign that I wasn't serious about the trip that my mind was elsewhere. And in some ways, I suppose she was right, because I was the opposite of serious. I was easy and spacious and free because I was walking in a skirt. So as I bring uh, this talk today uh, to a conclusion, um, I've been talking through some experiences, some projects, some practices, some opportunities, some hope, I think, uh, about fashion, design and nature, exploring lots of different centres of focus. 
There are, of course, many different characteristics of this new relationship, and I'm just going to mention a few of them here. And maybe if all you remember from this talk are these, then that will be good enough. So as we go forward with our relationship between fashion and nature and begin to think about what does it mean for how we live, we need to live with greater humility. We need to activate direct experience as a source of knowing and to mobilize that in powerful ways that show the diversity of experience in our communities and also of ecosystems. We have to be active um, an active engagement with this work and what we can do in the world. And this is combined with a loosening of control. We can't control all outcomes and in fact an attempt to do so often is highly impactful on nature. In fact, it's almost like you have to have a presumption of no power. Uh, and as we go forward, we see that this is not just human centred, but instead it's facing the change responsibility. Um, so as I uh, hand over to Anya uh, to ask uh, some of the questions that you've been posing, and please do pose them. It's really important that we have a dialogue. That's my favourite bit of, of these talks. Um, I would say that, you know, what I am going to do after this talk is to continue and I hope you will join me in your own work and, and lives in a, a restless experimentation of what it means to change systems. Um, because it's really important because our faith and our hope lies in the world um, and I suppose it's time that we started acting like we know that. Okay, thank you all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you Kate, what a journey. That was both um, very thought provoking and inspiring, and very necessary. Um, so we're going through some questions now from the audience. Um, so the first one that came through uh, was, isn't the concept of fast fashion, mass produced and using cheap labour, now just unstoppable? Oh, um, no, it, it, it's not. So uh, fast fashion is uh, a business model. It's not an inevitability. It's a business model that people have elected uh, to choose and we can choose other ones. It does feel almost like it's been uh, handed down by God or something that, you know, it's like set in stone, but it's not always been thus um, and it can change again and things do shift. I mean, what we know about culture is that it shifts quite fast. You can look at examples like, you know, a ban on smoking and suddenly everything changed about people's expectations around smoking and other th things change very quickly. So I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. That said, I'm not in any way complacent and I find uh, I find it one of the most critical questions that we ask. Sometimes it's sort of cynically uh, presented as um, something that is democratic, uh, that we have choice to lots of cheap garments. Maybe it's something that allows uh, people from lower class groups to be able to afford to express their fashion identities and all of these various arguments are, are enacted. But I, I would say that I think that, you know, these, um, these are largely specious arguments. Um, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, actually democracy is having uh, control over the means of production and just choosing between a pre-selected range of items is, is not that. And it is the case that the current fast fashion system, which is sometimes justified because it's creating jobs, isn't creating good jobs. And we can't uh, not change the system because of resistance within the current system. But I mean, it's a huge task. I mean, absolutely, I take your point. And it's a really good question to begin with. Thank you. OK, so um, next question is kind of twofold. 
So um, someone's asking, how can large fashion corporations be held accountable or reduce the impact of destructive practices? And how can textile and fashion students, how can we impact and influence this now? Um, so uh, questions around accountability are, are closely are closely linked um, to governance and one of the things I think that's really important to talk about and have a conversation about all of us together not just me uh, but everybody together is um, is to talk about understanding that governance isn't just something that happens uh, in government like in Westminster or whichever country that you're in. It's not something that just happens in these seats of political power, capital P politics. It's not like that. We are all um, daily uh, making decisions, regulating decisions about you know what we eat, uh, what we wear, where we go, you know, how we organise our lives in our communities. And there is real power in us recognising that we ourselves can govern uh, our actions and choices and begin to do that. It is true that uh, a self-styled local fashion government, even if we set one up now with the people on this call, like based in Leeds, you know, making decisions about what happened in Leeds and the environs, it is true, of course, that that wouldn't have any traction necessarily over a big international fashion brand. And for that, we need to work together with capital P policy, politics and other things and work together. But in all of this, it's really important that we don't think that this is somebody else's job to fix. When I talk to parliamentarians, they frequently bemoan the fact that they don't feel they have much power. They say, I mean, it's so ironic. I go there saying, oh, you know, could you like, you know, introduce some legislation or change the law? And they think they say, well, actually, we think that you've got more influence than we do because of the way that uh, uh, legislation and changes to legislation goes about. So we're in we're in a situation where even uh, the um, uh, the all was it an all no it wasn't it was the environmental audit committee which uh, recently did a review of fashion and launched its report and it made a series of recommendations the boldest of which was to put a penny on the uh, cost uh, of every fast fashion garment that was sold and this was some way to sort of tax it a, a penny just a penny. Uh, and that uh, was seen uh, and all of the recommendations by this committee, were, were dismissed by, by the government and not a single one was taken on and not even a penny. Um, so you can see that we're at the mercy of lots of different things. That said, there are really exciting initiatives that are happening at UN level. There are things that are going on driven by the climate emergency that are focusing minds. There's lots of different lobbying going on. Um, but yeah, let's not give our power away. Let's recognise that we also can be in charge of governing ourselves and our communities and we can make different choices and perhaps that's one of the ways uh, to shape what goes on in big global fashion brands. Thank you Kate. Um, we have another question here from um, Philippa Jackson, another senior lecturer on the fashion course. She's asking the connectedness with clothing that you discuss can be seen in locally based micro businesses. Is this fashion system a way to redirect the consumer's interest? Absolutely. Um, one of uh, the things that is really important is that we recognise um, the role of fashion in creating the, the places in which we live, the role of fashion in creating livelihoods and meaningful employment. And this is, of course, not to, to look away from uh, what will happen if big brands pull out of Bangladesh or other countries. It's not to do that. It's to recognise that actually um, different sorts of priorities come up in different regions and these can be met. Uh, uh, and employment gain, employment that's meaningful and that is supporting families and other things in local areas. But also it's recognising that uh, local taste, uh, distinctiveness can begin to emerge. So the thing that globalisation has suppressed, which is all of this diversity, can potentially begin to be fostered. 
But it is true to say that many of the things that are going on in local areas don't just sit within the formal economy. There's a lot of informal economy action and working on a local level tends to enable that to take place. And this sort of broadening our sense of what, you know, econ economics or economic activity and what constitutes good economic practice is, is really important. And there's lots of different opportunities. And there's lots of like really great work, for example, uh, written by Gibson Graham about what plurality of different economies are and can be to help us stretch just stretch our imaginations a little because it is very easy to sort of get you know locked in um, and so that's one of the tasks of this that's one of the continuous things is to continuously su be surprised or surprise yourself maybe by asking different sorts of questions okay Great, I've got another question relating to localism, actually, um, just unpacking that a little bit more. So how can a local fashion ecology work in a globally connected online world? Yeah. Perhaps this is a question that I'd like to ask whoever asked the question. How do you think it could work? Um, so, you know, it's not like we're ever going to uh, not be globally connected. We are inevitably. But the point I think is here is that we don't need to scale up these locally conceived of uh, and uh, uh, active fashion systems, the local fashion systems. But what they do is we can just network them. And the idea then is that the replication of good practice in different places, but with local distinctiveness and flavour and character and interest and weather conditions and ecological resources and what takes place. And so this is a way perhaps for us to, to build a sense of, uh, of what we are in an interconnected way, yet so, so that localism isn't insular or protectionist, but actually steps out of that. I remember um, uh, reading um, in a Victor Papanek book where he, he was talking about uh, you know, designed it used to be called sort of design for, for the minorities. You know, you, you design for like people short of stature or disabled people, people uh, uh, um, in wheelchairs, whatever it is. He says, you know, when I, actually when you think about it, designing for all of these groups becomes the majority. And actually, that's the sort of way that I feel about it. The local fashion systems be, can become uh, very easily, conceptually at least, the dominant fashion story. And this is really important because going forward, what we see is that the fashion industry will exist absolutely within a, you know, within a climate emergency because it will continue to exist. It just won't be this current configuration. It will be a different version of that. And it'll probably be less dominant and not so central. But instead, all of these other things will begin to percolate up. And that's, uh, for me, a very hopeful message. Yeah, that's very encouraging to hear. Absolutely. Um, so we had a question uh, from someone asking, where does the process of change need to start? Is it with consumer behaviour or in the supply chain? Everywhere. Uh, uh, simple answer. Um, the, uh, the, the truth of this is that the um, the way and maybe this is like um, an inherited legacy of, of sort of binary thinking is we tend to frame this as a consumer producer sort of binary. And actually, um, I mean, the, both of those are stakeholders in this and there are more stakeholders too. So perhaps it's us sort of naming what the other stakeholders are and making sure that they're present in this conversation. But maybe I'll answer the question directly by saying, if we were to ask a, a systems uh, change uh, thinker like uh, Donella Meadows, for instance, what she would say in answer to your question. Sadly, now she, she's dead, but from her work, I'm going to sort of offer you perhaps what she would say. One of the, the easiest ways to access um, her work, and I've actually drawn upon it a lot in quite a few of my, my books and other things, it's to it's to look at the places to intervene in a system. And she offers nine different 
ideas of places that you can go into a system and begin to affect change. And what she did very conveniently for us is she put them in a list. So she listed them like in an order. But what she did, uh, which feels perhaps counterintuitive when you first look at it, is she ordered this list upside down. So at the top it's nine and at the bottom it's one. And the thing that's at the top is the thing that she positioned at the top, she positioned it there because she said that's the place people tend to begin. But actually, it's the place that's least effective in driving big change. So what she was trying to encourage you to do is to not start in the place that you traditionally begin, but to start in the place actually which does drive the big change. And then you look down the list, the thing that people tend to start with is a uh, question to do with material and resource flows. And that's where people try to endlessly affect change, but actually it's very, uh, it, it's it's not going to deliver the big wins. As I sort of tried to explain in the fashion nests diagram, it's because those are embedded in a bigger system that ultimately influences what goes on there. And her point, which is the point that Matilda and I make through Earth Logic, is that you need to start with asking about the purpose of the system. You know, what what's this system for? Who's it stand for? Who benefits? Is that what we want? Do we want the people who are benefiting from the way that it's set up at the moment to be the people that benefit? I mean, most of the time when you ask people that question, they go, oh, who benefits at the moment? You're like, oh, OK, so it's just like the shareholders or the owners or those really rich people. And you're like, do they need any more of this? And you're like, actually, no. So, OK, so then we can we can change it in a different way. So. Donella Meadows also tells us about different things we can do. You can insert information into the system, which is what like labeling schemes and transparency indexes attempt to do. And that is quite an effective way. You can change the rules and the goals of the system. That's an effective way. Uh, and so she offers all of these different things, but it's a, it's really worth looking at. So it's called Places to Intervene in a System by the magical Donella Meadows. I'll have to check out that list. Great, thank you. Um, here's a question relating, I assume, following um, perhaps Instagram accounts or social media. So uh, someone's asking, when following activists or inspiring creatives, is there any way to avoid greenwashing within fashion and nature? Just repeat that question. That any ways of what greenwashing? Avoiding greenwashing. Avoiding. Mm. Oh, well, it's the ongoing challenge, isn't it? It feels like... Um, I don't know whether it's specifically nature at the moment that's being co-opted, but whatever is the key word at the moment quickly gets co-opted uh, and is is used um, often to mean many things very rarely, which actually it was intended to do. And I think it's it's such a problem. Um, effectively, what happens is it waters down the essential essence of that thing and then renders it powerless. And for those of us who are working for example, in deep change or transformation work or maybe with nature for that to then happen is, you know, it's it's hard to take. And yet at the same time, um, we have to be savvy. We have to think, OK, well, what does that really mean? Can that claim uh, be held up? Uh, and obviously it's for you to do the asking, but maybe more importantly is maybe to I mean, obviously words matter. Language is extraordinarily powerful at, at shaping uh, ideas, uh, thoughts, actions, but also we can do something else where we look at the language alongside the practice, the practices to which the activity and the words are pointing. And then that's probably evidence of whether what's going on is, is, is actual. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's really complicated. Certainly in uh, in Norway, um, the consumer. I wonder what they would be called. Uh, like the consumer rights organisation or something. I don't even know what we would have in the UK. It's not which is it? I don't know. Whatever they they're called. They they uh, took H and M uh, to court. Uh, for the labelling of uh, some of the ranges of their garments as sustainable and indeed H&M lost uh, and had to remove uh, the labels. So in some countries careful 
uh, attention is paid to the language that's used around thing, these things and attempting to uphold certain standards. But in the UK, that's not the case at the moment. OK, great. Um, so here someone is asking the so they say the media could have a huge influence on the future of fashion and sustainability. What media communication do you think would have the most impact? It's really true. Um, the uh, the pressure in the media um, is is colossal to be tied to um, to uh, the productionist extractivist model, even in uh, journals where there are uh, sustainability uh, pieces. At the same time, other articles are put forward which are promoting, uh, you know, business as usual priorities, progress sales, all this other stuff at the same time. And it, it's obviously a, a, a real experience of cognitive dissonance to read like Vogue business. And I'm, I know I've been uh, talking to a journalist there and there's going to be a piece on degrowth uh, very soon. I don't quite know when it's coming out. So there's going to be a piece on degrowth, part of which is based on earth logic and Inevitably, in that same thing, there'll be something else which is talking about like the old ways. <laughs> um, and obviously, this is this is really challenging. But uh, telling stories uh, from the new paradigm, I mean, one of the things that is very difficult to do in work that's uh, moving us forward into a space that's not fully formed yet is that there are very few examples there. So finding ways to talk about what fashion is without examples, using like I was trying to with creative writing, using that maybe as a way to begin to to open out and uh, begin to uh, change the sorts of questions and priorities that we have. At the moment, a very narrow spectrum of activities is prioritised. What happens when we tell a broad array of stories, when we show the full spectrum of activity? And I don't just mean about the garments within a natural world setting. I mean, I don't just mean about that at all, but about all different types of economies, different means about what fashion is. Um, yeah, it's huge. Uh, it's really true that fashion media has this massive, massive role to play. There is a, a journal in the US, um, gosh, I can't remember what it's called. Maybe somebody would know on the call that only um, includes images of secondhand clothing. Uh, uh, so there are attempts to use visual material as well as part of this uh, storytelling. Um, actually, I just can't remember what it's called. Um, sorry. OK, great. Um, we have a question in a slightly different direction now. So someone's asking, how can we start educating our children and what can be done in schools? Um, so, uh, yeah, this is this is a question which makes me want to talk about curricula, uh, but um, that feels like hiding to nothing. I. I have two kids, they're a bit older now, but um, it, certainly when they were in primary school, there was a lot that uh, the teachers did and felt able to do, but that was in spite of the curriculum. Uh, they're now uh, you know, in secondary school and uh, there's, there is no wriggle room. So it's a, it's a big set of questions around what we see or what seem to be deemed to be the educational priorities or even more maybe what the role of education is. And um, maybe if I was to think about, you know, what is like the role of education? And this is spanning across, you know, from primary right up to tertiary level. Maybe you'd say the role of education was about, about preparation for the future. Um, and in a climate change world, what we know about the future is that it's, um, it's changing, uh, it's ambiguous, it's uh, it's not going to be something that we can readily plan for. It's, uh, you know, it's it's all of the things that need different sorts of skills to cultivate. And then if you think, OK, so if we're going to try to 
to prepare children for an unpredictable future, which is the one that's coming up? What sort of things do we need to cultivate in their children? And of course, it's like critical thinking, uh, different sorts of knowledge about plays, about you know, deep knowledge, absolutely. Um, and then it's things like a, a rigorous imagination and ability to see beyond and begin to mobilise or perhaps to take action. Uh, and then plainly it's the skills of resilience. Um, these are the things that have been tested through the pandemic, of course, and perhaps that would have helped. Um, but I would say like my simplest answer is uh, to get the kids outside um, and they don't have to live, you know, like near wilderness or something beautiful. It's, it's literally to see the sky, um, to look at the, the bit of moss that's growing on the top of a wall, to, to begin to talk about and notice and value these other things. This ecological literacy is it like the basis um, of so much of this other knowledge, this knowledge that I'm building on. I mean, I grew up without any of that. And uh, it's like it's like a huge gift that's been given to me later in my life. Um, and um, it's the most precious thing. Um, but, you know, raising kids is difficult. I fully accept that. And, you know, my kids are beautiful and very trying. Um, so as all of our kids probably are. OK, indeed. <laughs> So um, I've got another question here, very specific, asking whether you think the redesign of clothing rather than the recycling of textiles is the future. Um, uh, I, I think I don't want to, what I want to say is I want to talk about uh, the um, the, the life of clothing, uh, not even the redesign of it. I want to talk about the life before the next phase. That's what's the future, finding ways to inhabit that uh, and to use um, all our design intelligence to operate in that space. What does it mean to begin to mobilise life, the life before the death, if you see, and rebirth of clothing. This is where the energy needs to take place. Certainly repurposing is better than recycling. Most people know about the waste management hierarchy. You know, you've got to keep things in their highest embodied energy state, which is in its existing form for as long as possible. That's the way forward. And all of the evidence that we see is that uh, wearing again and again the things you've already got is absolutely the lowest impact uh, behaviour. And sometimes people find that like quite a depressing thought. And yet, you know, even just on Monday, I was on a call with some people from a, you know, a group like the new version of Extinction Rebellion fashion called Fashion Act now. And in that call, there are people who are trained as stylists and other things, and they were going, actually, we've discovered that the real mission of styling is uh, is just about wearing clothes in, in creative ways. It's not about telling people what to go and shop for. It's all these other things. And, and so I think that that's the thing is we have to find a way. And if you're interested in like use, uh, usership, uh, the craft of use, um, I did a big piece of work like on that. Some of the stories are available on the website on a project called Local Wisdom. And there's a book um, which is holding up my computer uh, called Craft of Use um, about that. And I think there's there's lots and lots of scope. There's lots of scope for us to, to really start uh, living with uh, the things that we already have. And um, people, you know, feel that, uh, you know, well, you know what, how is that even possible? And then I think it's when we look to things like mindfulness and we see that with people who are uh, in, in this sense of um, uh, focus on, on things, that there's less of a, a, a restlessness and an urgency to sort of move and change. And I mean, maybe there's something in that. I mean, the point here is that we have to learn to want what we've already got. Uh, and this is the trick. Um, uh, of course, the opposite is the thing that uh, marketing and everything has been trying to encourage us to do, and it's seductive, absolutely. Um, but what if the most 
the most radical garment was one you already owned. What about that as an idea? That is radical. <laughs> um, actually, that's, um, yeah, um, very thought provoking with someone asking, actually, if you could give any examples of companies or brands that you think are going in the right direction. Um, I always find that so difficult to do. Um, I would like instead to, to redirect that question to talk about practices, to talk about what we do, how we act, how we choose to be. Those are the things that we need to be cultivating. And um, I mean, maybe you think I'm just like ducking the question and perhaps to some extent it is, but it's also part of telling the new stories, uh, staying with the trouble of trying to talk about what the new paradigm is like. Um, you know, often uh, it's a bit unclear and, uh, you know, we're sort of feeling our way. Um, but that's why we need all of you to feel your way with us as we're in this new territory, because it is new territory and that's like, you know, so amazing. It's exciting. It's full of possibility. It's even full of hope. And actually hope feels hard to find. Um, within uh, the climate emergency, but, but there is, I think, hope in this sense that, you know, we can collectively uh, pursue things differently. Um, yeah, and maybe even a few things I've said today could perhaps be the start of that for you. But absolutely, go out and inform yourself, read other things, and then simple questions uh, to ask yourself, to catch yourself, um to ask yeah what is this for what's what am i doing i think are really powerful um as we begin to affect change mm. thank you kate um i think we're now coming to the last question and i think this might be quite a quick one anyway um so someone is asking the dictionary of how to live in the future was interesting please could you tell me where to find it and also the link regarding gibson gravel and plural economies please um, yes, yeah, so David Fleming is the author of the Dictionary of the Future and I'm not sure, I'd have to like uh, fiddle around on my computer to find it, which you probably wouldn't like me to do at this point, but if you look online and do a search for that, you'll find. And the, um, the Gibson Graham, so it's two words, Gibson Graham, it's two different authors who write together. Uh, uh, under the one name Gibson Graham, you just do a search and they are prolific. They've written books and loads of academic papers and other things. Uh, and it's really, really worth um, digging into and spending some time with. OK, thank you. Um, I think um, that was perhaps it. We have one more very quick. If we have a couple of minutes to answer, perhaps the last question would be, what do you think gives garments most value in the eye of the customer? Oh, that is such a hard <laughs> question. In the eye of the customer, what is the garments most value? Well, I suppose it depends which customer. Uh, look, I mean, how can I answer that? I, look, the I answer is I don't know. Um, I, it varies, doesn't it? If you talk to the people in Norway, they would say that if, when people buy things, they justify it to each other by saying, oh, it's really practical. And I thought to myself, I've never heard anyone in the UK ever describe when they buy a purchase, they describe, you know, it's like, it's really comfortable. People say, oh yeah, it goes with everything else. It's you know, all of the things. So what you begin to realise is really cultural um, and that's seeing it like that and not as a fixed thing is one of the most powerful things that you can do because you can realise that we can just begin to shift that. Fantastic. Sorry for finishing on that. A tricky question, um, but I think that was all the questions that have come up now. So I think that's perfect timing. Thank you again very much, Kate. Um, that was that was a fantastic, wonderful journey you took us on.
You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Yes, um, Kate, thank you so much. That talk was really amazing, <laughs> so full, provoking and actually what a great way to start the new year. If anybody's got New Year's resolutions, I think you've really set that for all of us actually <laughs> uh, with things to think about. So thank you so much, Kate, again. It was really, really fascinating. And thank you to Anya also for hosting the Q&A and to Leeds Beckett events team today for making this such a wonderful um, start to the new year. Uh, just very quickly, um, thank you all for attending and just to say that there are two more Inside Out talks coming up, um, one on your screen on the 9th of February uh, with Gail Murchison, uh, Black Music Matters, and also um, another Inside Out talk, uh, which is actually a half day conference, the Modern Audience Conference, which is on the 2nd of February, 12 till 5 o'clock. Uh, information is on our website. And that's with Bernie Sue and Yoko Taro, which is about um, interactive stories, creators, fans, commentators, uh, looking at interactive storytelling and for, across various platforms and technologies. So those are our next two coming up. But uh, it's three o'clock. Thank you all very much. Kate, thank you so much. Annie, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for attending.